Oh, good evening. Is everybody hear me okay? No. Is this too loud? No. No? Okay. I'm getting a little echo here, so it's hard to tell. Uh, but good evening. Uh, my name is Rick Foss, and uh, I used to be the uh, city engineer and public works director for the city of Iowa City. And I'll get into some of those details in just a moment. I want to introduce my wife, Karen, who's here tonight with us. And uh, so thanks for coming. I think this is the first time Karen's seen this stuff. Other pictures I show her in all along the time. Uh, but anyway, let me lead off by just giving you a, a tiny bit about my background. Uh, so Karen and I uh, graduated from Iowa State in 81, and I graduated in 82. And we spent a couple of years in Des Moines. I was an environmental engineer for the uh, Iowa Department of Natural Resources. And then Karen spotted a, a job in the paper in Iowa City. She said, hey, you should apply for this. And I had no idea what was in store, but uh, we did apply. And I uh, came over here, and Karen picked up her pharmacy degree. Uh, recently retired from back career affairs. Uh, but I've been that for 31 years for the city of Iowa City. And uh, now I'm teaching at the University of Iowa. This is my eighth year of, of teaching there. Mm -hmm. what, eight? Eight? Good to see you guys. Um, so anyway, I alluded to that I really didn't know what was in store for me at Iowa City. And, and, and what you see here in, in the picture, this, this is Iowa. And each county has a different shading depending on how many disasters it's had. And you can see the darkest county of them all is, is Johnson County. So, you know, the, uh, the storm gods, the disaster gods, for whatever reason, frown on our county. And uh, so during my career there, I, I managed the response to the uh, four largest floods of record, uh, two derechos, a tornado, and a big fire in our landfill, and then other smaller calamities. Some of them will be was on the city council. And uh, so anyway, enough so that, that when I retired, the press citizen dubbed me the uh, master of disaster. So it's, that's not the, the title we dream for when we retire, but you, know, you take what you can get. But it didn't stop there. Uh, you know, when, when the, the, the plague came along, you know, the COVID, uh, in 2020, that happened to be the year that I was president of the board here at Oakville. So it seems, it seems to follow me. So with that introduction, let, let's jump into triple, triple trouble. And I'll share with you just, just three of those disasters. I've taken about four hours of material trying to squish it into an hour. So we'll see how it goes. Uh, but, you know, we're not going to have a ton of detail on each one. We'll lead off with the tornado. And that was April 13th of 06. And uh, that was, uh, went right through downtown Iowa City. And that's, that's one night I was actually glad I was working late. I was there. And I uh, watched it come in on the radar. And it was in a position to begin response right away. And that, that was really nice. Because I was able to call people in before the tornado was even out of town. And, and I'll tell you, as part of that response and trying to figure out what had happened in the city, it was kind of like, you know, when you fall down and you just are not sure what hurts yet, and you're doing this analysis, but we're doing the same thing, but on a city-wide basis. Uh, because as soon as people started coming out of the rubble, we're getting calls, and the 911 center's getting calls, and our police, fire, ambulance crews are going out and responding, and uh, going out and evaluating uh, some of the damage that has occurred. And meanwhile, our public books crews are coming in. They, they have predetermined goals for events like this, and that is to, to clear the arterial streets in front of hospitals and fire stations and police stations so that we can reestablish really important transportation corridors. And then our, our fire department put together five teams of two firefighters each and went out around the community and did a very quick and dirty damage assessment and radioed information back to us so that we could, we could see what was going on. And uh, one of the things they found was just north and east uh, of downtown, there was a lot of gas in there, a great deal of natural gas in there. So we had to do an evacuation and set that up at, at uh, the uh, Memorial Union. And I want to share with you, if, if you are, if, if you do need to partake in the evacuation, you, you want to get there early, but you might end up in this mattress. Okay? <laughs> and you don't want that because you won't sleep at all. <laughs> and another thing we dealt with that night that, that we've heard of but haven't had to deal with is the SBC. So that's a sudden bar closure. And uh, so we've got thousands of students. This is a Thursday night and, and it's just before Easter. And uh, the bars are pretty packed when the tornado hit. And they're all over out there. 
we had no power in much downtown, a couple liquor stores there. We're worried, so, you know, to get out the dogs, right? And, uh, but they were completely unnecessary. These Iowa kids are good kids, they're just curious. And, uh, and in fact, uh, this, this one right in the middle here, uh, he, he was my intern at that time, uh, front and center, <laughs> getting in trouble where he shouldn't be. So that's one of the things that we put the National Guard on, is just keeping people at a safe distance uh, from things. So, you know, we worked through most of that night, and I did get home and get a little sleep for a while, but it wasn't until Friday morning that, you know, the sun came up and we could see what was going on and looked around and did some of the damage. And it was pretty extensive, uh, considering the, the tornado that we had. And it's interesting that the number of the cars had popped from the pressure differential. So when you look at these with the glass on, there's very little glass inside. It's all outside because they, the windows blew out. And I also like the way this person wrote their phone number on the car. So when people are cleaning it up, they can, they can uh, contact them. But you get outside the path of the tornado, and it's like any other Friday morning. We, we consciously made a decision to keep picking up garbage and do other things because uh, you don't want to get behind and let those things snowball on you because you, you've got that response to deal with. Uh, but back to the path of the tornado, it was fairly narrow uh, as opposed to the dredges, which were citywide. Uh, but this was narrow and intense. <clears throat> and one thing's challenging us is, uh, is you know, clearing the streets. That's the first step to, to getting uh, getting back on your feet again. And if, if you do it like this, where you cut it all up and take it out, it's going to take forever to do that. It, it's going to be weeks before you get roads cleared up again. Uh, but, you know, our crews at the city, they, they know how to plow, right? They, that's one of the things that they, they do. And uh, so they went in with chainsaws, and they cut here, and they cut there, and they pushed it to the side, and then they moved down, and they cut here, and they cut here, and they pushed it to the side. And, uh, but they had to be careful, because, uh, well, first of all, they, you'd end up with something like this. That's, that was the, the finished product that they would end up with. Uh, but they had to be careful, because there could be property in there. And not everybody is accounted for yet, and, and that's what the, the only fatality, that was a squirrel. Uh, here. And uh, so I share with my students, you know, that just so that they learn from this experience, they, you know, that night probably started out like any other night from squirrel surfing the web, and then he saw the, you know, the, the tornadoes come and went outside to watch it, and then he's gone. So you know, learn from that. Uh, but, you know, our, our students did have quite an experience out there. Uh, you know, her apartment is, is gone, blown away. And uh, they're just having a hard time finding their stuff. And it wasn't just the students that, that were hurt. Uh, the, the Catholic Church downtown, uh, some of our, our businesses downtown. And this is the new home of Riverside Theater, right? So Karen and I will be going there not, not long from now. We just got our tickets. Uh, but you look at these old buildings, you know, and they got hit pretty hard. And then you look next door, and this building actually took more of a direct hit, but it's built to different building codes than in the past. And there, there was not a whole lot of damage. And, and I'll, I'll share with you that the, the newest uh, standard for, for building codes just upped the, uh, the ante for tornado protection. So it's going to be even better than, than what we have right now. So, you know, through the day on Friday, it became apparent that, that some people were making decisions that, that were in their best interest. And so we, we thought it wise to go out and, and inspect and post buildings uh, if they were not safe. Uh, enforcing it was another matter, but at least the, the people had some, some information to base the decision on and whether or not they should enter. Um, and we're doing damage assessments on that Friday, trying to get a feel of the, of the full extent of the damage. Uh, this traffic signal, this is pretty cool. It, it illustrates a couple things. One is, is that since we've gone to LED lights, those so draw low enough power that we have battery backups at those intersections. So if we lose power, the lights are still going to work. The other thing, and I like this, is the, the circuitry is designed that if, if, you, if you damage it, it goes to all red. So there's not an opportunity for conflict at the intersection. So if you don't believe me, next time you're out, Plow into one of those, knock it over, and they go back and look and see that they're all red. And they get out. Okay. Uh, one of the other things that, that was evident is that we got a lot of hail right before the tornado, and that's what I credit with, with us having very few injuries from this tornado. Was if anybody did go outside and look at it, they were forced back inside uh, by, by the hail. Uh, by the end of the day on Friday, we had a pretty decent.
recent damage assessment, we put together this map of the extent of it. Because FEMA was coming on Saturday morning and they wanted some of that information. Now on Saturday, uh, people are already starting to get stuff out to the curb and we needed to make a strategic decision on our debris management. And, and a decision we made is that we asked people to separate tree debris from building debris. Because by separating those, you don't need to landfill the tree debris. Right? There's other things you can do with that. You're not going to waste that landfill space. We'll talk more about that in just a little bit. Um, Sunday was Easter. And you know, we just we gave everybody a day off on that day. People had been, they hardly had any sleep since Wednesday night. Uh, because this tornado was on Thursday night. And, and some people had damage at their own homes. So that, that was an opportunity uh, for me and some others just to create a game plan for how we're going to get to clean this up on Monday. And what our Monday morning game plan was, is that our, our garbage truck's going to run their regular routes, and they come back and start working the perimeter, work their way in, and then we were going to get the heaviest equipment and start in the middle, where it's first, and they work their way out, and hoping they would meet somewhere in a few weeks. And uh, so that the garbage men did their thing, and, and you know, tornadoes do weird things. What this tornado did, more than anything else, is it, it seemed to suck a lot of old couches out of these houses. <laughs> We picked up a lot of couches that day, um, or days. And then inside, inside where the debris is the worst, we got a lot of trucks lined up, and then, then we uh, rented some, some equipment and operators, and we actually went after this in stereo. We had two of them working side by side on Iowa Avenue, and I'll, I'll take you through so just what a great job they did. So this is Friday, and this is Sunday. Remember, we didn't work on, on Sunday, so this is how what they did today on Saturday. This is the way it looked on Tuesday. It's cleaned up really fast. And, I, and I'll back this up, and I want you to watch the way the power poles reappear. The power is, is resupplied. So we're cleaning up at the same time Mid American is putting in the power poles. And there were a lot of storm chasers came to Iowa City, and they wanted to work for us. And, and we sent them away saying, well, we can do this locally. And, and we did a very nice job of them. So the cleanup went much faster than expected. Uh, we got the streets cleaned up, and then we, we focused our attention on the creeks. Only 14,000 were lined this time. Uh, because, you know, it's, it's April, and we're worried about flooding. So we got the creeks cleaned up, too. So let's talk a little bit about that marine management. Uh, we diverted about 25,000 cubic yards uh, from the landfill. So that would fill Kinnick Stadium up to about row 15. So that you can imagine that's how much landfill space we saved by that decision. That was a good thing that we did. And uh, some of the good wood was cherry picked out of there. And then we, uh, we rented a, a uh, grinder and added that to the grinder. We already had it rounded up and we gave it away. People were coming from all over the state uh, to get this stuff. And you know, spring didn't come that year. Leaves came out. Flowers were good. And, and we, it, was, it was a pretty decent year after that. And we put things back together. So if you're interested in learning more about the tornado, the library has this really nice interactive tool online so you can, you can get there and um, get some stories from different locations. Uh, so with that, I'm going to shift to the, uh, to the flood, 2008. So the 2006 tornado was a warm-up exercise for the flood. And, you know, this disaster really started that winter. That 2007, 2008 winter was terrible. It's like the worst point in my career. You know, when you're, when you're in charge of snow clearing for a winter like this, it was, it was awful. We went, uh, that spring, we went on spring break to New York, and, and Karen says, I just kind of shuffled along the other family. <laughs> I was shocked. Uh, but we had, we had a ton of snow that winter. And in fact, uh, this pile of snow that, that's down south of downtown, this is what we trucked the stuff out of downtown, we put it here. That had not melted yet when the flood came. It was still, it was still like this high in June. Uh, so we still had snow on the ground when the flood started. And those winter storms turned to summer storms and just kept coming in this regular pattern and ate up the, the volume at the, at the reservoir. And then the Corps of Engineers called us and said, hey, things look bad. And at that point, you know, Karen, having been through this in, in the 1993 flood, she was leaving on a business trip that week anyway. And so she took our daughter with her. We have two kids, Emily, a daughter, and Sam, our son, who's getting married next month, <laughs> inconveniently to a woman named Emily. Uh, so we got to deal with that. 
that's okay. We want her in the family. Anyway, so she took our Emily with her on her business trip and arranged for Sam to go stay with friends so that I could just dedicate 24 hours a day to this because that's that's what it ends up being when it calls calls the middle of the night. Uh, so anyway, you know, once having been through this before in '93, we know what to do. We we uh, shut the these are valves here on the storm sewer system. We have had a few in town. We can shut those to keep the river from backing in. We get the pumps out because the valves are shut on the storm sewer. You got a pump, right? You get that, you get the local rainfall out. And then we get to do some surveying to see where we need to put sandbags in. And we put out a call for volunteers, and we got eight volunteers the first day. And these, I don't think they're volunteers in the technical sense of the term, but they, they were there anyway. <laughs> And uh, we got some, some sandbagging done, but not nearly enough. So we had a press conference trying to stress the, the urgency of this. And we got a few more folks helping sandbag, but it wasn't until the flow started to go over the emergency spillway out of the reservoir that it really got people's attention. And then we have large numbers of people coming in and helping. And, and that, that last week there, we were putting up about 100,000 sandbags a day. A lot, and, and to do that, there's a lot going on behind the scenes to support that operation, and, and not the least of which is finding sandbags. You know, the Corps could give us some sandbags, but they could not supply what we needed. And uh, I'm so proud of our, our staff here, uh, Tom Hansen and uh, Rodney Waltz. Now, Rodney, he was in the first Gulf War, and his his job was building uh, field hospitals, acquiring materials and building field hospitals. And these guys were getting uh, sandbags from the U.S. and in three other countries, having them sent in. And uh, when Coralville ran out of sandbags when they were working to save the Marriott, uh, they called the governor's office, and the governor's office redirected them to us because we could get sandbags better than, than the state of Iowa could. So that was, that was a good thing for, for Coralville because we were able to give 100,000 bags. And again, you know, once the sandbags go in and you block the storm surge, you've got to have pumps to put in place so when it rains locally, you pump that, that the water into the river because it can't get there by gravity anymore. So we're bringing pumps in from around the state and getting those set up. Jeff uh, Gears, how many went to the uh, dedication of the new Stanley Art Museum? Anybody go to that? Yeah. Okay, good, good. Uh, you know, I, I saw some of the, the stuff leaving the old Art Museum for the for the last time uh, in that flood. I was I was making my rounds that evening and I saw them emptying that out and, and things still look promising at that point. But I just thought that's that's a good preventative measure they're doing and it's a really good thing they did because this area, the Arts Campus, uh, right here, I just have our old don't I? Okay, uh, did all fill up with water. So this is the Art Museum at this location. You can see it's surrounded and quite a bit of water got into that. And then you can see that this is just the street in front of the, the art building there. And of course, we lost the, the Parkview Terrace neighborhood. We had sandbag all along the river there, but it, it ultimately came over and flooded that neighborhood. And we needed to do an evacuation of that. Uh, a few other shots, the Memorial Union. Not many people realize that that actually flooded from the inside out. Okay, so it was sandbagged very well. But the, the flood broke into the steam tunnel system at the university. And once it got in there, it's like electricity and a circuit board. It just went to every building. And if it was low enough, it flooded from the inside out. They've got submarine doors in there now to prevent that from happening again. But, you know, they had great sandbags, but the flood waters came from this, this direction. A couple shots of a pantry, got very wet. Um, this pretty is. This is the only building in town that was cleaner after the flood. <laughs> yeah. uh, this is a shot of Riverside Drive going down to the Art Museum. It's just off that way. And we had dignitaries come. That was interesting. Chuck Calder came. He's very low maintenance. Comes, fills few sandbags, and, and uh, greets some people. And you know, it's really a really nice visit. And then the, you know, the President of the United States came, and he took a lot of, of criticism for not getting on the ground in Katrina, okay? And we were the first big event after that, so that's one of the reasons that, that he visited with us. And that's a whole bunch of work getting ready for a, a uh, unscheduled presidential visit. So he's got a lot of staff that comes in to work with them, and then the Secret Service arrives. These guys, 
they're really interesting. They got this loose clothing and lots of weaponry with them. And uh, then the Black Hawk helicopters start coming. And that's when these guys took my camera. <laughs> and I, I can't share with you the rest. They, they, you know, they, they wouldn't let me document it. Uh, I did get my camera back later. They gave me some cool George Bush uh, cuff lights as well. So I did get to meet the, the president. So one of the things that we're really worried about is the Park Road Bridge. It's our lowest and most vulnerable bridge. And, and the thing to understand about bridges is you worry about floating away. They, they can have buoyant forces on them. And bridges aren't attached to their piers. They just sit there. The reason for that is, is you've got to allow them to expand and contract. And if, if, you, if you bolt them to their piers, they're going to tear themselves apart. You just you can't do that. Um, so. Uh, and, and then as the water comes up, if it gets high enough, it traps air in between the beams, and it's like this big pontoon boat that's lifting off the, off the dock mound, and then it'll float away. And we're like scratching our heads, what are we going to do with this? We had some ideas, but then the, we get a call from this guy in California. He's a retired engineer. He's been watching national news, and he's like, he says, I, I helped design that bridge, and, and it can't take what's coming. <laughs> and we're like, yeah, that's what we're thinking, too. You have any ideas? We have ideas, but what are yours? And he said, you got to drill the deck. you got, you got to drill the deck to let that air out, which is, is what we were, were thinking about doing. But it's a destructive thing. It's going to reduce the, the, the rate or the, the life of the bridge. But we did drill the deck. So we drilled these holes, and we did that you know, in between each beam so that there's, there's plenty of holes in there. And then when the water came up, it came over the bridge, you, you could see the air escaping. And uh, the bridge didn't go anywhere. And we made sure of that our survey crew was up right up here, see the tripod. And they're watching for any lateral movement in that bridge at all because there's a great deal of lateral force on that. Now, go downstream and you get Burlington Street. That's the next most vulnerable bridge. But that's not our bridge, it's the DOT. So, and we said, we want to drill that. And they're like, no, no, you're not drilling our bridge. And the problem is, if this one goes, it's going to hit the other bridge. There's two bridges there. And they're all screwed up then. So in, instead of drilling the deck, what we did is, is we had one of our bridge engineers run, run the counts and determine how, how high can this water get before we are no longer comfortable with the safety of this to have people going over it. And did the counts and hung an injured over the side so you could put this line in a little arrow right there. And then we had somebody watch it. And if the water got to there, we shut the bridge. And then Iowa City split in half because Burlington Street was the last open bridge at that point. That mm -hmm. street was above the water, but you couldn't get to it on the, on the west end. You know, because our transportation was pretty messed up. We got South Gilbert Street, Highway 6 West, Highway 6 East, Highway 6 1, and 1 and 6 South, and Butte Street. So a lot going on in our transportation system. And that's tough when you're dispatching police fire and ambulance calls. Uh, shifting gears and looking at our water utility. We've seen a lot, we've heard a lot about Jackson, uh, Mississippi, uh, after their floods down there earlier this year. We were in pretty good shape. Our, our water plant that we built in 2000 sits on top of a hill because of the experience we had in the 93 flood. But our water sources are still down in the footprint, because that's where the water is. So it took some effort to protect those, but we had a lot of volunteers come out and, and we're very successful at that. Now our wastewater plant, our north plant, that, that was another matter entirely. And we, we started protecting that, but that, that plan quickly turned to developing an exit strategy. You know, how are we going to get out of here in a way that, that has the least amount of damage that will allow us to reboot as fast as we can? And there were many lessons learned from Des Moines losing their water plants in 93. And one of those was is, is that you can't let the water hit energized electrical equipment. You've got to shut things down in advance. And any time you can, get that electrical equipment out of it so you don't have to bake it to dry out. Uh, so this stuff's too big and heavy to get in the boat. So we got this, this truck from the National Guard and went in and we pulled critical electric equipment out of there. And then uh, part of our exit strategy is that we needed to protect one building. And that building is the inflow pump station. So when the, when the Sewage comes to the plant, it's way down below ground, and you pump it up to run through the plant. And we had to keep that running. 
because even though we couldn't treat it, we don't want it sitting in the sewers, right? We gotta get it out of there, otherwise the footprint of this disaster goes way beyond the floodplain because you've got sewage backing into homes and businesses for, you know, for miles, literally. And you, you don't want that. So we were successful in keeping that going. Uh, our trickling filters started to turn red. It's like, what's going on? And looked at it close as worms, just hundreds of millions of worms washed up from down inside it. And uh, afterwards, these, these trickling filters performed better than they had in decades. You know? <laughs> the, the, we have no idea how many worms were living in this and the, the worm soils, you know, the worm poop was, uh, was polluting our, our effluent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so eventually, you know, the, the, the flood peaked and we went out, you know, we had some fragile uh, points, but we gathered information about you know, where, where, how high the flood got. And it peaked on Friday the 13th of all days uh, in June 2008. And if you recall, the tornado was on the 13th. And the, the declaration of the, uh, of the pandemic was on Friday the 13th. And uh, my next birthday. <laughs> this, this is a very disturbing pattern. Uh, anyway. Uh, before we move on to the, the landfill fire, I'll just comment that in subsequent the 08 flood in, in 2013 and 14, we had the we had the uh, third largest flood of record and the fourth largest flood of record that those two summers. And sandwiched in between, we were in a severe drought. How's that possible? You know, the weather has just gone crazy. I'm just going from one extreme to the other. Uh, so that's that's a significant thing to deal with. And uh, so the other the other thing uh, is the landfill fire, and it's it's not on the 13th, no, 26th. And for you math whizzes, that's that's two times 13. And it, it was like twice as bad as, as the other things that we dealt with. Uh, remember that day well because our, our son's graduation party was that day, and ours was all wrapped up. We're out with some friends, relaxing with a beer, and just enjoying it, and then get a a text, the phone call started with a text, and it was a call. And we had fire to landfill, so I took off. And I'm driving out to the landfill, and again, this doesn't look good. And then I turned the corner onto the landfill uh, road, and, and it just get angrier uh, by the minute. And uh, when I got there, you, here you see garbage on fire, and what you see burning here is tire drive aggregate, which is part of the mining system for a new cell that we had just built. This is a 14-acre cell, and most of it was, was didn't have garbage on The fire started right about here, sometime after closure on that Saturday. And then it, then it took off straight from there. So the majority of the fire was the liner burning, not that much was garbage burning. And everybody asks, you know, what caused it? We'll never know for sure, but, but my best guess is it's probably a lithium battery. So in, in, in 2000, okay, there, was, there were 12 fires that year, smaller scale fires. And, and seven of them, as they put them out, they found in, in at least seven of those, they traced them back to lithium batteries. And uh, those things, if you throw them away, and then they get smashed up in the garbage compaction process, those chemicals combine and they start fires. And that, that is a problem that we've got to come to grips with and make sure that people aren't throwing those things away. Anyway, back to our fire. Uh, I'm doing good. I thought the pastor was uh, Anyway, but the wind was out of the south and just blew it down that, that tire direct aggregate really fast and it, it spread quickly. And this is not the kind of fire that you can, can put out with, with hoses and ladders. Okay, you got to treat this like a forest fire and create a fire break. And that's exactly what our staff was doing. They got out of bulldozers and, and they're, they're putting a fire break in place to stop it from getting out into the rest of the tire drag aggregate. We've got one working up from the south here, another one coming in from the north, but the fire beat them to the meeting point, so they had to drop back and regroup. We had no experience of how fast this, this stuff burned and how, how quickly it spread. So they backed up and started again, building a new fire break further out. Meanwhile, uh, we got our, our scraper and we're, we're putting dirt, we're putting soil on top of the garbage that's burning. And we can do that because garbage doesn't burn nearly as hot as tire drag aggregate. You can drive over it and it won't ruin your tires. 
So we're working on smothering that and then containing the tire drag aggregate. Uh, and, uh, but that tire drag aggregate is, is burning at over 2,000 degrees. It, it's burning really hot. And uh, you know, the melting point of aluminum is below that, and there are a lot of aluminum parts in, in this equipment. And we have onboard fire suppression systems on all of our equipment out there because of the propensity of fires in a landfill. But those aren't designed to protect our staff from something of this magnitude. So we wanted to make sure that they did not get stranded out there in those super high temperatures. Uh, so they were very careful. And also, I'll point out that this is, this is the fuel tank that completely surrounds the person operating it. Okay, so you, they want to be careful. So what they would do is they, they would feel the, the dash or the, the glass and watch the temperature gauge and, and occasionally come up and let their cooling systems catch up to the engines, let the skin temperature and the equipment drop, and also re-get their bearings again. This is fire spreading quickly, and then when they're ready, go back down in and, and keep fighting the fire. And uh, up there on the, on the left there is our landfill superintendent on the right is Ron Kanucky, who's our city engineer at the time, on his public works record that uh, you know, just trying to develop strategies for trying to get this under control. And I've never been around a fire like this. It, it, was, it was, you know, as I said, super hot, and there's these fire tornadoes just drifting around on the side out there. When they go by, it just feels like it's going to blister you. It, it, it just turns up the heat incredibly. And then they, they dissipate and another one will form and go by. Uh, but our, our folks worked into the night and they got it uh, contained about between 11 and midnight. And so we were able to button it up for the evening and it left staff out there all night, of course. Again, like the tornado, it's good to get back out there in the daylight and take a look at it. And here you can see that fire break in here that was built. So this is unburned tire red aggregate. This is still burning here. And um, we're inspecting it, and, and then about 9 in the morning, the fire jumped the break. It got into the, the stuff that had been pushed back on the other side of the fire break. And they, they cut that off, and then it jumped again. You can see them working. And what we found is the fire was getting through the leachate collection system underneath the, the entire red aggregate. It was spreading underground instead of overground. That's why we weren't seeing it jump. Uh, but, uh, just an idea of the heat. This is where we had a, a HDP high density polyethylene uh, dissometer there, and it just completely melted. And uh, those areas where the, the, the aggregate was burning, it, it didn't look, it wasn't giant flames at that point anymore, but it, it didn't seem to be going anywhere. And uh, so our fire department was out there, and on their pumpers, they have 250 gallon tanks, and they put 250 gallons. Uh, class A foam on an area about this half the size of the garage, maybe a whole garage. Okay, and it knocked the fire down for, I don't know, half an hour, and then it just started coming back up through. You see the fire coming back up through that. And this gizmo right here, that is a, it's a, uh, it's a thermometer. You can look through it and you can see the, the temperatures. And that's where you can see this, this thing's back up over a thousand degrees already. So the, the, the Class A foam wasn't doing it for us. There's no way we're going to put it out of that. And this is something that we dealt with on multiple fronts. We had the fire, and then we had this byproduct of the fire. When, when tires burn, uh, they create this thing called pyrolytic oil. And it, it runs off, and it went into our leachate collection systems. So the good news is it was being collected. Bad news is it, it was going into the same lift station that we need to pump landfill leachate into the, into the wastewater plant for treatment. What are we going to do with this? Well, we called an oil recycler. He came down and sucked the whole truck out, took it up to Cedar Rapids, and they were really upset because this stuff was so much more volatile than regular oil. We had no idea how bad it was. Uh, so what we did, first of all, they said, we're not taking it anymore. And you can't ship something if you don't know what it is. So we, we took samples and we sent it to the lab. So we're kind of in a holding pattern. But in the meantime, we still got this, this leachate, or uh, the pyrolytic oil coming in, and we got the leachate that we've got to get into town. Um, so what we did is we rented a frack tank. This is a 21,000 gallon tank, and, and we would just pump it all in there and then just wait and let it decant itself. Okay, so the oil goes to the top, leachate goes to the bottom, and then we pump the leachate into town, 
and we put the the uh, oil, the pyrolytic oil, in a utilization basin that we have out there. So we'll come back and revisit this later. But the, you know, another thing that we're facing is the smoke. And some of you may remember that the smoke is coming into town some days, and it's bad. It's all over out there. Uh, you know, this is how it looked from the west side of town. This is how it looked from the east side of town. This is what it looked like from the Cedar Rapids Airport. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's uh, all over. And we brought a lot of partners in on this because this this is a public health plan, right? It, it, it's got engineering components trying to control it. Uh, but we're, we wanted to get access to some real-time equipment so we could do some measurements in the flu. And then this, these uh, tanks right here, they have a vacuum in them. You send somebody into the flu, open the valve, and it sucks it in. And then you can do lab analysis of that. And, uh, excuse me, we're taking samples around the county. Here you can see all sorts of different locations represented in different colors. And the one thing working in our favor is it seemed like the wind didn't blow the same direction for more than two days in a row. So it kept shifting it and not subjecting the people to the same smoke day after day. And uh, while we're and now analyzing this, uh, one of the things that we're able to engage the help of is STRATCOM, STRATCOM Center. So this is, this is the, the arm of our defense department that it comes into action if there's a weapons of mass destruction attack that involves chemical or biological or, or dirty new uh, techniques, things that are airborne. They specialize in air monitoring. And we gave them some of the critical information about our, our fire, and every morning when I got to work, there was a report that, that told me every half hour of the day what that plume was going to look like, what the intensity was, and and where you know, it all fit. It, it was at different levels. This is quite a high level, so landfills out here. And they could project where it would skip over and then hit the ground again. And they were they were uncanny at how accurate they were. So I, I'm very impressed with those those models that they were able to do for us. Uh, but again, we just we cannot figure out how to put this thing out. And it looks innocuous during the day, other than the smoke. But that same spot at night, you can see the fire there. And uh, if you're in charge of a landfill that's burning, you don't sleep well, so you're up late at night on the internet looking for solutions. And, and one of the things that I was seeing, and our landfill superintendent, who's also had a solution science, we're, we're seeing these same products out there, these miracle products that, that, that help put out firefighters. And uh, our, our landfill superintendent is a chemist. And you, know, you can see what this stuff is. It, it's, it is uh, surfactants to break down the surface tension of water and make it wetter. And then, then it's a uh, emulsifier, so you can mix it with other water and put it in suspension. And they want a lot of money for this. And you got to wait for it. Uh, so instead of paying the money or waiting, we called Procter Gamble and gave a recipe and said, can you make this for us? And they're like, you bet. And uh, so it wasn't long at all. They, they sent out a 55-gallon of homebrew uh, of what we wanted, and we mixed that with 900 gallons of water and sprayed it on, and you know, we got pretty much the same results as, as the fire department did, too. So, at this point, this, this is starting to get national attention, and, and the EPA sent a team up from, from Kansas City, and they recommended a technique called stir, burn, and cover, which ultimately we implemented. So we hired a firm, they brought, they, they didn't bring this equipment in, they rented it. And, uh, They've got, let's see here, they've got oxygen tanks on there for their employees to wear while they're doing the work. And, and what they do is they, they stir it up, and when you stir it, it, it just, you release a lot of this, this gas that's packed in there. It burns super intensely, and you let some of that stuff burn off for a while, and then you cover it. And you can see why they're wearing the tanks. They're in, they're in the clouds there. And there's, there's another shot. And, and, you know, this is rented equipment. I just figured we're going to be buying that before this is over. Uh, but it actually cleaned up really well. They had minimum damage to the equipment. And then cover. You know, we have a lot of dirt up the landfill because we dig big holes to put garbage in. So that's, that's a nice thing. We have a lot of dirt. And you can see they're dumping it a long ways from where the fire is. And the reason they're doing that is this is burning so hot, it's coming up through the clay as it's placed. And I can tell you from buying tires like this for, for our equipment out there, 
It's about six thousand dollars per tire, so you do not want to, to ruin those, and that's why you do it that way. Okay, so in about a week and a half of that, if we had it covered up, the fire wasn't out, but it was covered up, and the, and the smoke well, the smoke was gone. I just I don't have time to go in about all the details of it, uh, but you know we still have this this oil to deal with, this pyrolytic oil, and we're starting to get some of the lab results back, and, and we're learning that it's, it's very much like jet fuel, okay? Now we have about 150,000 gallons out of there. Flashpoint is under 100 degrees. Now, flashpoint is not the point that it ignites. It's the point at which it off-gasses a flammable mixture. So it's, it, it can be, it's an explosive atmosphere. And those were very hot days when we were dealing with that. So this had a combustion potential, combustion equivalent of about two 747s. And this, this had our fire department worked up, and, and we get that, and they're, they're worried about that. And one of the things we did is, is we brought down one of the trucks from the Cedar Rapids airport that might help if we did have a fire, but really what we're more worried about is the explosion before the fire. Uh, so one of the things that we did is we rented more of these track tanks and we're going to containerize this so that we, we don't have the, the explosion potential that we did have. And we'd start work in the middle of the night and work till about, about 8 in the morning when it would get too hot and move things with pneumatic pumps. We didn't want to use electric or, or gas pumps that have, have an ignition source. And every piece of equipment that came on that site was grounded. And, uh, it's one spark and everybody's gone. It, it's all over. So you absolutely cannot risk a spark on that site. And uh, so we were able to containerize it all. Uh, eventually, we did get the, the test results back. So now we know what we're shipping and we've got information that we can give to hazardous waste processors and trucking companies. And we hired a number of trucking companies and, and we, we want to get rid of the packs. So we shipped it to uh, five different states in Canada to get rid of it. And, it. and it turns out that it wasn't as expensive to dispose of as we thought because of its volatility. So they could use this as a fuel source to help combust other hazardous waste that they were processing at their site. So I guess we got the combustibility discount. Uh, and then, of course, we needed to rebuild the, the, the site out there. And uh, which we did the, the following year and got that put back together. And I, I could talk another half hour on that. Um, for you insurance people, we did make the cover of Insurance Journal Magazine. Uh, experts question, I see uh, fire coverage. And I, I think those experts were, were mostly people for the our insurer <laughs> did not want to pay. Uh, but they did eventually pay. We, we had a good legal team working on this and, and they, they did a very nice job. So anyway, that's, that's pretty much it. I hope uh, maybe you can come out and visit us at the landfill sometime. If you do, stay out of gate lane three, okay? Because that will get you where you don't want to go. And let's see, I, I just have a couple of general slides it, it, you know, related to current events is, is that, you know, in my, my teaching mode now, uh, and, and the benefit of the hindsight of my career, uh, you know, I can attest that this this article right here that, that you know the demands being placed on our infrastructure are changing quickly, and I teach a class on resilient infrastructure so that the, the next generation of infrastructure being built is going to be more resilient and able to deal with, with the extremes that we're facing uh, versus some of the stuff that we have out there now. And I mentioned uh, Jacksonville or Jackson, uh, Missouri. I don't know if you've heard about that in the news, but they're one of the floods that they had in the last month knocked out their water plant. They still don't have water down there. And that's a community where their, their water facility had been underfunded for a long time, a lot of deferred maintenance. And it, it just shows what happens when you combine those things with a natural disaster. Uh, you, you've got an unlivable situation. People are just without water for weeks on end. Um, so with that, I'll open it up to questions if anybody has any. How much did all this cost? <laughs> <laughs> all of them? I've never totaled that up. Um, it, a lot of money. <laughs> Sim similar question though, when I retired, uh, some people in my office, they totaled up all the projects I'd worked on and uh, how much they were worth. And it's like $350 million, which seems like a lot of money. Yeah. 
like the, the new interchange out here, 83 to 80, it cost more than my entire career. <laughs> and this made me feel bad. Anyway, and I should mention, uh, John has been a mentor of mine for, for years, and, and the things that John taught me put me in a position to deal with, with these things, and, and I really do appreciate that. So thank you. Thank you. Yes, Eagles. What effect would the carpet dance of halfway or three quarters have been done? <laughs> I check those slides out, Pete. Um, so, my best estimate is, is it made about 18 inches of difference in the water surface profile upstream of that. And that, that difference diminishes as you go upstream. Okay, so by the time you get to the Park Road Bridge, it was down to about nothing. But so they, it did hurt the university. The university property got hurt more. I mean, they got hurt by their, their copper dam, but it really didn't hurt anybody else. That's good. This is not a question. This is just a comment. I just thought that was fabulous. Just so exciting. And the, the photos are amazing, too. But yeah, what a career you had. <laughs> well, hey. Thank you. Now, I will say, and, and I should thank the, the press citizen and his death. They've been really wonderful sharing their photos with me. So about, about a third of the pictures in here were from, from the Gazette and Press Citizen. Great organization. But thanks. Anyway, thanks for listening tonight. Karen and I